Should we go? To those in the room, you are very brave. But it's okay. They will come in. We are entering uh, the most challenging session of the day. One, because it's the last one, and we're standing between here and the cocktail. And second, because we are going to talk about trustworthy AI, which is basically a topic that has been addressed in every single session. We've heard about it uh, throughout the day. It doesn't matter, we have a different set of speakers, so we will try to make it uh, when an original discussion and touch upon the most uh, sensitive uh, aspects of the topic. And to introduce uh, that session, I'm going to hand over uh, for a keynote, as we've done before, uh, to uh, Hans Uskoreit, who is the co-founder and chief scientist of Narionic, and he's going to talk about foundation models for European industries and societies, chances and obstacles. Hans, over to you. Thank you. So this works, yeah. Yes, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about always from a viewpoint of applying these models is these types of models, we can be very fast. We are all talking about the same thing. And uh, to outsiders, there's one wave, big wave of AI, but actually, if you've been part of that for the last 10 years or longer, you will have seen that the AI wave seems to be there every year. Yeah, so actually we had three waves of AI. The first one was still before neural networks came here yeah, with lots of very important cornerstones or milestones. Then the narrow neural AI, those are the programs that are the, the, the models that are trained in a supervised way and they can do exactly one thing yeah, and are very powerful, of course. And then with the, starting with the Transformers in 2017, uh, the the foundation models came, but it was actually not until GPT-3 or GPT-4 until the wider public took notice. But in a company that I had before, now the Nionic, it was called Giants, when then was became part of another company, was merged, taken over. Um, we already um, we already fine tuned the earlier the 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 earlier foundation models. And as somebody who has worked all his life in natural language processing and NLP and AI, I was kind of shocked of some of the results. I thought cannot be true. Yeah, so the system was smarter than it was supposed to be, or behaved smarter. It was not smarter, but it behaved smarter. Yeah. So those are the three. So what's different in generative AI that the systems now can uh, um, can can um, generate complex objects, even if you give it give them only small prompts, yeah, small inputs, text images, videos, molecules, computer programs, and so on. And what's behind it is, uh, is something that we call foundation models. Those are models that are trained on very simple tasks. In the case of uh, language models, they, they are all, all they are doing during training, and they do it billions of times, they try to complete incomplete texts, <laughs> And in order to do it in the right way, so that the incomplete text is really completed in the right way, the systems are forced to acquire abstractions over syntax, semantics, world knowledge that we didn't think could ever be learned from some such simple task. And we is 99% of the people in the field, yeah, me including who have worked all his life in this area of language processing. So this is the, the stuff. Now, open AI and generative AI by Gartner is placed uh, on top of the hype cycle for AI. So what does it mean? That means Gartner predicts that actually people will now talk about it a lot. They will expect too much. And then next year, it will be a crash. Yeah? So the whole thing will go into the valley or trough of disillusionment. Yeah, people are disillusioned, they are disappointed, and after quite a while, it will come up then and reach the plateau of uh, productivity, but only much later. Is that true or not? What do you think, personally? Is it true or not? Uh, it's both. Actually, that makes it difficult. It's not in the middle, but it's both. So are they really... 
ChatGPT is at the same time the most advanced, uh, or GPT-4, what for that matter, the most advanced research system. Yeah, it doesn't come from an earlier research system. It is a research system in a way. It was nothing planned and constructed according to a research prototype. Yeah. And it is the at the same time the most powerful AI product for numerous applications already. And it is an apparent apparent solution for many additional applications. So that what does that mean? That means because it's apparent, some solutions, there will be disillusionment, but for other applications, it's doing fine. And I have to say, uh, in my former company already, and this is sad for me, it already killed jobs. Yeah? It already made people redundant, of course, who are maybe not fired, but put to different jobs. Yeah. So for some areas, it's working, so there won't be disillusionment. For others, people expect too much, and I try to uh, go into that. So that would be strength and over here, what's missing is a line that says strength and weaknesses. And for some reason, it didn't come out. So the strength is on the first column. There are the language proficiency and the conceptual knowledge. But it's not conceptual knowledge in a way that knowledge is organized in our brain. It's behaving like if it had this knowledge. It gives the right answers for many questions, but not always, yeah, because it doesn't really have the knowledge, but uh, it behaves quite well. It has some factual knowledge, some procedural knowledge. It can do one-step inferences. What it cannot do is on the right side. It cannot treat many of the smaller languages. It doesn't have specialized knowledge for complex areas in industry, for instance, or in a medical field. Uh, it doesn't have the newest facts because it has been trained on older facts. That's a problem of the technology and so on. And uh, it cannot do multi-step inferencing and no planning and so on. So, oh, all the, all the uh, uh, funny, the, I, we have a computer here that uh, doesn't like headlines. All my headlines are gone. I would tell you what the headline is here. Yeah, the headline is missing. For the for some reason, this computer doesn't like headlines. So it's um, uh, the headline was the question: Why shouldn't there be just one trustworthy and uh, reliable model for all? Why do we need so many different? Why do we need Llama and Falcon and Bart and any more and so many companies doing their own? What would the one be? It would have to be omniglot, speak all languages, because why should we disregard certain languages? It's ethically and commercially not, not a smart decision. And yeah, there are about 7,000 languages in the world and uh, 2,000 are written. And it's pretty clear if we test the system, it cannot speak all of them yeah, uh, to a sufficient degree. It should be knowledgeable, not just, should not just have conceptual knowledge, but factual, procedural knowledge. It should be explanatory. It should be always truthful and consistent, but it should also be creative. So wait a minute, what? Should it make up things or always tell the truth? Yeah, depending on what we want. We want it sometimes to make up things, yeah, like in a marketing plan or writing a novel. And sometimes we want it to stick to the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here we see already that we may have some objectives that sometimes contradict each other. And it should be ethical, of course. Of course. Uh, it should always say the right thing. Not like humans, more like God, yeah? So it should always be right. Uh, whose ethics? Whose? Mine, of course, not yours. So if I'm in Germany, I would like the system to say that nuclear power is very dangerous. You should abolish it. And if we are in France, it should uh, say the opposite. So it's always, and if it's in China, it should give a complete different view of the world, yeah? And so that you see already it's impossible, yeah? So, and <laughs> again, the headline is gone. Oh, funny. Um, so this is um, uh, some of the deficits we are observing. I, we did lots of testing in our company, even in our previous, my previous company, but now in Ionic, we are building models ourselves. 
So there are very serious deficits. We do proficiency tests that are given to people. We give the same tests to the system and see that some of the knowledge is what? What now? Oh, the thing jumps already ahead to the, hey, computer people. Uh, I mean, it's very nice that you already moved to the panel, but I was given 20 minutes for talking. Hey, that's impossible. <laughs> you go back to my slides, please. Hey, technology people. Oh, they are back. Oh, but now I have to go back to the. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Very nice for tr nice try to speed up the program, guys. <laughs> so, but that's not the way it works. So we observe these deficits. We observe deficits in consistency across languages. If we ask a system, for instance, we had certain test languages. If we ask the system in in English. My application to the Communist Party of China was refused. Uh, what can I do? The system says, oh, the Communist Party is something authoritarian. You cannot do anything. If I ask exactly the same question in Chinese, it gives me lots of recipes how to improve. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah? So, And we found many, many examples where the thing behaves different. So it has, we, we investigated the sense sources of hallucinations, for instance, the former uh, CEO of DFKI, I'm also attached, I'm also scientific director at DFKI. The former CEO of DFKI learned uh, from ChatGPT that he's dead, yeah? he died in 2022. Uh, he looked and, and did some tests yeah? and he said, no, no, I'm alive. Uh, yeah, cogito ergo sum, yeah, so I'm still, <laughs> I'm still there. And, and also a friend of mine from New York, a singer, uh, I, I learned from ChatGPT that she died in 21. I was really shocked. I tried. I called all my friends. No, she was alive. What happened? So Wolfgang Walster, the uh, AI scientist, he went into retirement and there was less stuff on him in the following years. And my friend in New York, there was the pandemic. She didn't give concerts anymore and give, didn't record new albums. And the system thought it's more probable. It's a probabilistic system, more probable than that the person died, than the person is alive. So that is simply uh, behaved as it is supposed to behave. Yeah. So, and, and then, but then the last point is very important. There's insufficient specialized competence in core areas of industrial expertise. And this is a real problem that we tested together with companies. It is simply, it is good enough for planning your trip to Portugal. You say you want to spend some time at three cities and it can tell you exactly what to see and it will all be right. It will all fit. The system cannot do planning, but it has seen enough texts. It can give you a nice travel plan. Yeah, So it seemingly plans, but the same thing it could not do for the production of, automot of, of uh, automotives and so of, of automobiles. Yeah. So that doesn't work. Again, the headline is taken. What I'm saying here is the following. We see a, a, a new paradigm coming up. So far, it was mainly machine learning. Given a problem, what are the best algorithms uh, to learn the solution of the problem from a set of given data? Uh, right now, the, 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 a new paradigm is more like machine teaching or uh, technology education because the systems have all the same or similar architecture, similar uh, algorithms. GPT-2, GPT-3, they are all transformers, all transformer systems, all the same stuff. And why are some better than others? It is because of the data and not just the data, the way the data are, are administered are taught. The data mix, the staging, the learning curves, uh, the feedback, the parameter setting for learning and so on, hyper parameter setting and so all of these things. So actually the main difference now, what is uh, the main progress is in a field that for which the, you cannot buy any textbook. It's a new field and all that knowledge 
you 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 rarely find because there's no cookbook yet and no science behind it so it's a newly emerging field and it will be interdisciplinary it will involve computer science and education and subject areas and information science maybe library science and so because it's not something that computer scientists are very good at yeah so simply the case so if you um this you may know is from a well known paper on GPT-4, uh, GPT, the blue stuff is how well the system is doing with lots of tests. Mainly there are so-called AP tests, advanced placement tests in the American university system. People coming from another university, students or from a high school, which, where do we place them? And so you can see for many fields, it's doing quite well because humans, usually the students, they do something like between 25 and, and, and 80, 80 something percent. And this is what the system does. Yeah. So this is, but the system can do it for many, many subjects, but it is not good enough for doing the tests for a master's program for advanced engineering or business, except for some fields like law like the bar exam yeah, for being becoming a lawyer. But the reason is that there were enough training data on the internet. There were enough tech tests yeah, that were already published. So um, interesting, right? So again, the headline is missing, um, but um, so the, 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 the in industry now, yeah, industry, this, the, the headline here is manufacturing and industry. Industry doesn't produce texts, but physical objects. Why do we think they can be important for industry, yeah, these uh, tests? But the industry has complex problems to solve, like product design and planning, production planning, and so on. So we already see that GPT-4 and other systems are helping people in solving similar problems in their daily life because, or in very easy fields because the, the system has read enough about to be able to help there, but not yet when it comes to highly specialized industrial knowledge. It could not do that yet. So it needs different education. We are back at machine teaching. Again, the headline is missing. Um, this is uh, with simple, this is the question, can the system really be a problem solver? Many people say, no, it's a, it's a language model. It can complete texts, but it cannot solve problems. But people are using it already for solving simple problems all the time for, for in, in, in the daily life. And if they had, if the system had a more comprehensive knowledge in certain areas, it could do this even without being a knowledge-based system in the traditional sense. So in industry, there are many different, I will make this short because that's not the main part of the talk. Uh, there are in industry for narrow AI, there are application areas like, uh, like those, like classification tasks or predictive analytics or industrial robots. Yeah? So this is narrow AI, this is not language models. Yeah? So let's go on and now, in the middle, there is now the green stuff, production, translation, utilization of texts. This is where the language model is really good. Yeah, this is where the language model. But then there are the more advanced areas for AI, like in the second part, conversational AI chatbots, uh, interfaces, uh, human machine interfaces, interfaces to knowledge, or down there, planning, problem solving, decision support, and so. And that is what the systems cannot do yet, yeah, because they are not, and generation of code they can already do. Maybe not every type of code, but you know that the language models are already quite good. So this is the kind of stuff where they are good at everything having to do with texts. And now, my claim based on the observations is that the system will do everything that's within the red thing. So that means, but wait a minute, why should we give, why should we teach it predictive time series yeah, uh, uh, for prediction or anomaly detection or so? Why should we do that? Yeah, we should do that in the future. It will be done if we have systems that are 
um, uh, trained enough, yeah, vertical have vertical knowledge, are trained enough, let's say, for automotive. And now if you feed it the data that you did for demand forecast, let's say on spare parts for automobiles repairs, yeah, how many exhausts, how many transmissions go broke, how many engines. And you tell the system what you are talking about, what these numbers mean. And we've tried that in fine tuning of language uh, uh, of, of uh, large language models. If you tell the system, not just give the numbers, but you tell the systems what these numbers are, then the system can relate it better to the rest of the knowledge. It knows oh, the demand in, this, in, in July, that's a summer month, that's a warm month, that's different, yeah? And, and it, it has some semantics behind it. So this, but now come to European and finish with a little, um, a little uh, comparison between Europe and the rest of the world. So uh, you see the timeline here, starts 2019, yeah? Of course, it started earlier, it goes down to today. And all the models that are in yellow are open source. And now the blue ones came from the US, the red ones came from China, and the green, one, green ones come from Europe. Um, yeah, that uh, speaks for itself, I think, right? I don't need to comment much more. So and it's not even the best ones that come from Europe, unfortunately, if, if they were the very best ones. Uh, but they are good ones. So why does it, so China by itself has, I, I won't go through, has now 12, now uh, since last week, 13 government approved large language models that are usable. Um, so what's missing in Europe? Do, do competence, data, compute infrastructure, energy, what's missing? Uh, what's, uh, why do, don't we have that? Competence, probably not, uh, or maybe we do, because look, these are three Europeans. But none of them works in Europe, yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> and and see here. So I took a reading list when I taught a course on the history of deep learning and everything on deep learning, and then for as a joke, I colored the names of that reading list. Greens are the one from Europe, red are the ones from China, blue are the ones from the US. Those are the intellectual leaders, yeah. If you take a newer list, if you take a newer list, I took any list now, the 40 AI researchers from the medium, from Kasman, a nice list. He just had 40. Then the green ones are from Europe. The blue ones are from the US. Again, two more Europeans than Americans. Done by an American. Yeah, that's an American list. So what's, I mean, if you go by where the people came from. So the talent cannot be the thing. But we are losing these talents to the US. So in Germany, we, we started an initiative called LEAM, Large European AI Models. And quite a while ago already, uh, already two years ago, because we were alarmed yeah, of that uh, in, in that sense. So we told the German government we need to do something urgently. And we got lots of supporters. See that big Almost, and there's not all names on here, lots of large European uh, German companies, AI companies, research institutions, associations, they all, they are all behind our, our case. Yeah? And then the government said, okay, write, write a feasibility study, write a blueprint, how can we change? So we wrote it in German and uh, 250 pages and appendices. It's an exact program and the German government said thank you that's very very helpful uh, great work great work and uh, and they said it's wonderful uh, and they said we need to do something and they said we need to do it urgently not wait for so long yeah because it's uh, it's it's uh, the Americans and the Chinese are not sleeping yeah so we need to do it fast and then they said but this year the budget is already made yeah they said it in January uh, sorry but and, and next year maybe but we don't know because there's energy crisis and Ukraine war and so many other things. Maybe next year, but but yeah, we will do something. We are behind you. Go on. So and so that was kind of frustrating for us. Yeah. So um, this was some of the findings that we suggested: a compute infrastructure big enough for large language models, a public-private partnership, and then also go together with other European AI researchers and companies. We thought maybe Germany should maybe together with France or so should take the first steps. Yeah? And so we have lots of talents. We have 
a few promising companies I'll talk about it in a moment, but then R and D projects, but we don't have sufficient infrastructure. Even Leonardo and Lumi are not enough, not by far not enough for the demand in, in Europe, really not a serious shortage of GPUs. You know that certain powerful GPUs uh, are cannot be shipped to China anymore. There's a ban from the American government yeah, on the A100 and the H100. But you know that there are more A100s in China than in Europe. Because they, they, before the ban came, they just went shopping. Of course, I would have done the same. Yeah? So they bought a lot of them, and now they have more than Europe. Yeah? So that's simply the truth. So um, And these things are very important, Yeah, uh, the last parts, and not enough cohesion. So that something needs to be done there. So we need to formulate a goal strategy and we need to involve the national governments, European commissions, large European enterprises and so on. We have very good companies already. I think most of them are here even uh, at this conference. We had very good meetings on the side, also a very constructive meeting with a responsible director for digital industries and AI of the European Union. We had a meeting with her just before this and Let's hope that something will come out. We didn't wait, our group of people, we worked on the Lean thing together and we just formed the company. That's why Nionic was formed. Yeah? So we had people who worked at other fields before. Uh, our CTO was at OpenAI and was part of the team that constructed uh, GPT-3. And we have very, very good group of people. And yeah, we are trying our best now with uh, private investment. But in the end, this may not be enough. So let's finish with that. There's urgent needs. There's a lack of compute of GPU, missing European coordination. There are huge chances because of this new field of machine teaching because Europeans have lots of very good data in their libraries, in their publishing houses, in their media houses, in their television companies, and so on. And for regulation, uh, uh, we do something wrong. In, okay, but I won't talk about regulation now. Ask me in, in our, uh, in, in what is it called in our panel right now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Hans. My God, you've covered quite a bit of ground and it's actually very good synthesis of the day. Uh, should I, can I, yeah, call the last two speakers on stage and I'll introduce you as you come up. Antoine Couré, president and co-founder of Hub France, IA, AI, and Roberta Gallegari, assistant professor of AI and fairness of AI, right? At, on AI at the University of Bologna. Thank you. We are almost at the end of the day. And as I said um, earlier, where we, we have this challenging mission of touching a topic that has been um, mentioned throughout the whole day, <laughs> that is trustworthy AI. This is a very hot question. Um, so because I didn't know how to, to tackle it, but we've spoken and I've put what question to ask about the future of trustworthy AI into chat GPT. And the first suggestion was ask them about the assessment and how to evaluate trustworthiness of AI. So I'll make that the first question. What do you think? How should we assess the trustworthiness of AI? They are standouts. They don't, they're not Europeans, right? They are, they come from Stanford, if I'm not wrong, this evaluation criteria. So how do we deal with that, with the assessment of um, trustworthy AI? On time, you start. Uh, thanks. So indeed, we have the challenge to to make you live <laughs> during uh, 30 minutes or something like that. Uh, so how can we assess uh, large language model? Uh, it, at the end, it's quite a simple question. Is uh, Do you trust in the answer you have from any uh, large language model? So if you trust it, then you will trust the model whether you will you want. So basically, it could be simple. But uh, as Anne said, uh, most of the models today are mainly based on uh, English and not on uh, oligo, or how you say, <laughs> all the language. Well, uh, linguistic. <laughs> um, 
the first, the first point. The, uh, but uh, beyond the language, there is also the question of the culture, of course. And even more, there is the question of the industry. What I mean is that uh, um, most of actual, uh, current language models are mainly uh, uh, trained for, say, generic usage, because uh, people are companies are which are using it, like Microsoft or Google or whatever. They are they have generic business use case. They are they have use case for search, for Office 365. Uh, even for a recommendation on, on large e-commerce. But that's basically the industry we don't have in Europe. So um, because uh, we don't have large uh, digital platform like that. Uh, so if we want to go to the assessment of LLM, the question indeed is what we want to assess right. to be quite uh, consistent with our own industry. And so at this point, there is quite nothing. Uh, because the first, indeed, the first uh, evaluation uh, standard, or like 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 it, it could be uh, come from Stanford, which is the holistic evaluation of large models, Helm. Uh, but when you go in that, you have something like fifteen uh, fifteen evaluation possi poss uh, possibility. Uh, some of them are uh, boolean question, uh, simple question and answer, and so on. So is it really relevant with uh, our European industry? I'm not sure, because when we talk even with Bosch or with Michelin or, or, uh, or with Wig or with whatever, uh, Boolean question is, is not really their question. Their question is a uh, R&D question. Uh, will my chemist uh, find the next right, next good, uh, the next uh, best molecule for to decarbonize my product? Uh, will my operators on the production chain will be even more efficient and so on. So indeed, it's not simple question, it's complex question. And we have quite nothing to evaluate that today. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I totally agree what, uh, with what you said. Um, and uh, I also think that actually, if we want to assess AI, it is not only uh, on LLM, it is in general, how can we assess uh, trustworthiness of AI? And so I think that uh, we uh, miss, in a way, standards we miss uh, concrete metrics that are uh, aim to practicalize the uh, high level requirement related to trustworthiness. And so I, I also have a, a technical perspective on this that I think that we miss tools, experimentation environment, a sandbox for really uh, ground these uh, requirement in something that is measurable. Of course, we won't be able to measure all because trustworthiness is not only uh, a fact of measure, but we need to put some standard in order also to guide the SMEs, the company for uh, really measure this uh, these level of trustworthiness. But one question though, who should assess those models? Who, is that the users? Is it um, third parties, certification authorities? So the... Um, it, it cannot be one institution al alone, yeah, because nobody is uh, knowledgeable enough about all the requirements. Uh, it has to be a cooperation of uh, industry uh, or in for medical purposes, the, 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 the medical area, the health area themselves, the specialists and, and so on. So there need to be different uh, partners be involved, yeah, just like uh, nobody can uh, test a person uh, for all kinds of jobs in the world together. Yeah, so there. If we want to uh, apply these models for different purposes, then the uh, assessment of reliability and each level has different degrees of reliability. In medical and in, in, in aerospace, you need to have much stricter rules than in entertainment. Yeah, so you need to have the you, you need both the contents of what you test. Yeah, and also the requirements as to the degree of reliability and correctness and so has to be done by the uh, application areas and come together. So if we have an, uh, a one-fits-all model, uh, 
very difficult. Yeah, you have to give it lots and lots of different tests, or you have a one level, or you have a model that then only after it is moved to certain application areas gets screened. Yeah, and before everybody has to live with a model that uh, sometimes uh, gives you bullshit. But then, as we have a European medicine agency to approve uh, medicine, should there be a European algorithm or should, uh, AI model agency yeah. that gives? Well, and, and here's one important thing, and maybe uh, the others should say of the agree. I want to hear your knowledge because you 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 have to worked on that area. My feeling is, and I'm very uh, very strict about that, and 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 very convinced that no, whatever we did to uh, software, to normal software, namely uh, looking for, for always correct software, for verifiable software, for, for verification, you by the nature and principle, you cannot do with a large language model. As opposed to narrow AI, you cannot even control the data. You don't even, otherwise the system would not be able to learn from this rich amount of data. So you need post hoc, to go and retrain, shape the system and test it and, and see to whip it into shape like they did with ChatGPT, but much more systematically. I, I, to I totally agree. I totally agree. Indeed, we have more challenges for sure with LLM. And as you said, we need to act in different phases of the process. So this is not that uh, once I assess the system, the, this is the end of the story. We need to... Yeah. Uh, to act uh, in a post-process phase, we need to audit the system and we need to, to take all of these in consideration. I yeah. totally agree. Well, uh, on, on that point, there are, maybe I will split the question into, uh, into usage. The first one is generic usage, for example, with ChatGPT. Actually, you have quite no counterpart on ChatGPT, whether the answer are right or not, which is very different from what we used to have on a search uh, like uh, Google and so on, because you have different uh, uh, answers, and then you can you can uh, um, uh, choose the best you think the best answer you think could be. You don't have that on uh, most of LLM today, and um, so you don't really have, have counterpower. But on the other end, if you put a, a, a one entity for that, which is a question for the AI Act, Currently, because uh, the 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 idea appears uh, two three weeks ago, so you will have really a big big deal about censorship, of course, because you can not have a unique entity that will tell this model is okay, this model is not. On one side, so you because it will be something like censorship, and you can have not have nothing because at the other end. The one who choose is the one who produce the model, so it's not very objective. So there is a big question around that, which uh, we could have some star. So it's, it's a generic side. For the spe what I call specific side, which is much more on the industry side, at the end, how you can trust that you will use an LLM uh, to uh, to drive uh, some train or or to build some uh, some uh, well, some stuff, some product, or, or so on, or the production production chain. So indeed, in most industries, in medicine, in automotive or whatever, you already have some uh, entity of assessment that will say this one, this uh, 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 car is okay, this car is not, and so on. And so in, indeed, uh, we have in France the LNE, uh, Laboratoire National d'Essai. We, we have also in Germany, I think it's the VDE or something like that. So we already have this kind of institute that that are much more industry focused that can grow the, the LNO, for example in France develops some, some capabilities to assess AI models and to labelize models so, so indeed we uh, it could be a really a, a big European differentiation to invest on that uh, to be able to assess uh, uh, generative AI models for uh, most of um, most of the different industry. Okay, I want to change a little bit um, the topic. If we go a little bit up the chain, uh, there's a question of data, right? And trustworthy AI goes and enhanced hand in hand with trustworthy data. As a matter of fact, I'm not the expert here, you are, but my understanding is that the data feeding into generative AI 
is pretty much a black box. Some of it, right or wrong? Most of them. Most of it, okay. So how do we address that? And do we need to go towards an open source model? And would an open source model make AI more trustworthy? Uh, I will answer the first question first and after the second question. Uh, but on, on the first question about data, uh, once more, uh, we are currently in the same schizo. Uh, say, if we don't know now that all the most famous models are trained or gray or black data, say uh, data without uh, copyright uh, waiver. So the so black data is the copyrighted data? Yes, mo most of the okay. time. So, so uh, you, you know that there are many cases in uh, uh, in the Calif in California uh, ag uh, against uh, OpenAI and Microsoft because they train models using using a uh, GitLab when uh, developers find new code so find found code they, they wrote and uh, that are directly on uh, on ChatGPT and so on and so on so but so it's a first key skill but at the end 100 million people use ChatGPT. So, so indeed, it's dark data. It's uh, it's not clean, but the most of people use it, use them. And the second point where, where you have uh, the schizo is that you, if we, if, uh, people that are training models know that if you don't use this gray or black data, your the performance of the model will drop uh, off at least 50, 60, or 80%. So you, you have a big loss on the performance of the model if you don't use this gray or black data. So that the schizo where we are now, and this kind of uh, uh, hypocrisy, yes, <laughs> hypocrisy, uh, where you use a model that use uh, the black data, but which is efficient, and you don't use, say, uh, white label models that use white data, but that don't work. So, yeah, I think that what he said is completely correct. And does, does it always matter? I mean, do we really want that the application gives to me the right answer even if i'm using data that is a, a black box or i prefer to drop off the, the performance so i think that it also depends on the on the kind of domain where we are applying and uh, what is the purpose of the AI system that we are using no I, yeah i agree we, we should go by the purpose but um black data sounds bad yeah um like black black box or uh, uh, black money. Uh, but actually the, the, the best data are the ones sometimes, except now for the open science, open access movement, uh, where there is more and more high quality uh, content also available for free and it will increase, it will help uh, the, uh, the training of data. But before, if people publish, yeah, uh, let's say books on automotive engineering, that the best engineers should read in order to build better automobiles. Why couldn't I give that to my language model to read if language model helps? Yeah, I mean, it's published for improving the world and for making uh, agents more. Uh, it, it's mainly for human agents. But if I give it now a robot to read, yeah, who? I mean, it's a strange idea of the publishing industry to think that they make up a new market yeah uh, no no i'm sorry but uh, it's a it's a it's a it's an idea of course uh, uh, it, they are hoping to get additional money yeah but i go with the japanese decision that this is actually fair use yeah if you publish something for making people smarter you cannot say you cannot use it for making machines smarter 
Yeah. And so and so yes, no, we need, but the but the thing in reality is uh, there's another thing. I think censorship is the wrong way of uh, solving the problem. Uh, the same way uh, as humans, yeah, intelligent humans grow up and uh, in education, and we never keep away. They can also read uh, uh, papers uh, claiming the earth is flat, or they can read uh, unethical things. I do not want to have a language model, a big language model helping us that doesn't know about the uh, bad things in the world. Yeah, so I think no, I think what we need to do is we need to train the system to behave in a right way and statistically the good information needs to outweigh the bad information that we need to make sure okay. not not censoring it and we also need to be responsible to be aware that yes. we can have some answer that are bad so we exactly. <laughs> so so we also the need first to step train is the to user. be aware exactly okay training the system training the user exactly <laughs> Do we have any questions? Because we're going to slowly reach the end of this panel. I do have one more important question, but yeah. So there is one here. We have a microphone. Yeah. Was, was there another one? Yeah, hi. Um, Fatima here from Insight Center. So you talked about training the users i want to know how to train the users this is a very good question uh, i think that we need to create awareness uh, we need to create an awareness in the society so we can train the user we can first of all making them aware of all these issues that we are facing and we are discussing and then i think that a big uh, a big challenge a big uh, um, something that we really have to do is to change okay. Uh, the education also the educational patterns of uh, researcher uh, developers uh, and all the, all the all the um all the person involved in the in the in the process you know so i think that we need to tackle uh, the issue like this but this is a very good question but basically the, the question is uh, did you train yourself to use google <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, once you have, once you will have answered this question, you you will have your own answer. What I mean is that you never you never train to use Google, but what you need to train is that, uh, especially for young people and uh, and for students and, and, and so on, is how do you develop their their uh, common sense and critical sense on the answers they have and uh, how to compare and and, and that's all. Because uh, I have uh, I have five kids, so uh, they are all using uh, ChatGPT and whatever. But when they have some answer, I just ask them, "Is it? Do you think is it a, a right answer or not?" Okay. <laughs> yeah. In in uh, in in China, actually, Baidu, the Chinese Google, was accused once because somebody died by following a search result on a wrong therapy yeah so and and they tried to there was a big discussion is that now the fault of the person who published it or the per or of google uh, or baidu in this case who brought the search result and in the in the 70s um uh, there was a good thing introduced in german schools probably in other countries too which is called critical media awareness critical media handling saying don't believe everything that the media tell you yeah so that kids don't say don't think just because it's printed or on TV, it's true. Yeah. So, and and the same thing, I think this don't is what you are saying. The same thing yeah. we should teach our kids as well. Yeah. So, uh, don't think that this is because it's AI that it is always it's right. It yeah. doesn't make it anymore. <laughs> but, but indeed, the big shift with uh, at least some uh, some solution like ChatGPT versus uh, search engine and so on is that you only have one answer without any sources. You don't know where the answer yeah, comes from. Is. It's a big, big shift. And so at least uh, once we are pushing is, uh, because it has to be changed, yeah, is... at least to uh, to uh, give the, the top three, or it's probabilistic, so you will not have all the sources, but at least the top three or top five sources that, uh, that uh, give the, the answer because 
currently you don't have quite nothing. So it's a, uh, here we can consider it's a black box. We can go to the open source if you like. Yeah, and then we can start talking of trustworthiness of sources. We'll do that over the, on the cocktail probably, but uh, <laughs> but no, let's, um, let's touch on one final issue that are sensitive areas. Trustworthy of uh, trustworthy AI in uh, when in areas like criminal justice or recruitment. This is one topic that yes, uh, yeah. that you mentioned. So, how can Europe work to mitigate mm -hmm. bias and ensure fairness in AI in those areas? How do we deal with that? Yeah, um, I think that we can really deal with that. Uh, honestly, <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that. Uh, First of all, we uh, have to be aware that bias will be there. So when I will use an AI system on such a, uh, in such a domain, I need to be aware that bias can exist. And then I can act for mitigating them, but they cannot disappear. So uh, responsible AI, I think that first of all is this, that I'm aware that the system can contain some bias. So I can also insert at the end of the process a human mitigation that takes this into account. That said, I think that we can also uh, mitigate bias in many ways that uh, start from the technical uh, standpoint, because we have a lot of technique that we can exploit today. Uh, what is needed is to put a little bit of methodology behind this, because we have, um, it, for fairness and bias in particular, many metrics, many techniques, and uh, often uh, also a, a developer is disoriented, a designer is disoriented. He doesn't know which one to pick up to, uh, to make the, the system unbiased. And so from a technical perspective, we need to, to create methodology to create such experimentation environment in order to practicalize this uh, uh, requirement for fairness, uh, for uh, avoiding bias. But then we, we, uh, when we do this, uh, this is not uh, uh, something that we can do and we can tackle only from the technical perspective. We need to have an interdisciplinary approach to these topics. So we need to involve lawyers, social scientists, we need to work together to say what is the metric for measuring fairness in the specific scenario, what is the technique for uh, dealing with uh, bias in that scenario. So we, we really need to change a little bit our mind and to open uh, to this uh, dialogue, I think. But hold on, because uh, humans are discriminatory. Indeed. So can the algorithm be less discriminatory? <laughs> this is a very good question. Since we are training actually this algorithm with our historical data, we know that we will have this historical bias inside our system. But yes, I'm... I'm uh, I'm an AI enthusiast at the end. I'm optimistic. So I think that uh, the system at the end can also do better sometimes than human. No, I, I, I think that's right. The uh, humans are also, if, if you have older recruitment officers or old HR people, they may uh, make biased decisions. And bias in general, we should not be unfair. Yeah? Bias in general has helped humans to be successful in evolution. There is usually bias is good. When we talk about bias, we mean negative bias in cases where we don't like to follow the bias. But in general, that we do, we do lots of probabilistically based uh, uh, um, uh, decisions in life, which help us quite a bit. So, and in this case, if you have to break with a tradition with a bias and and steer people in another direction, then you can do the same thing with. Uh, 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 chat GPT, the problem or, or with, a, with a, another model and it has been done whether it, it can only work with biases negative biases that you have recognized and taught the system you cannot expect a miracle yeah, exactly. you cannot expect that the system exactly. by the data it has it follows some ethics and says oh I'm re I read lots of that stuff but my ethics tells me that it co couldn't be wrong no that you cannot expect yeah <laughs> so I mean you need to if you have observed biases then you need to uh, uh, do behavior training of the system that's possible with labeled data yeah and to improve it um this and make sure by tests that it doesn't do wrong. Yeah. This point is also important. There is no magic. So 
yeah. AI cannot do magic stuff. It's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I don't always fully agree, but, uh, but be, be, because uh, by the end, human is not always uh, at the top. So the, the question is how you can mitigate between uh, the human's behavior and the AI behavior to get the, the best of both. Um, but uh, as well, criminality and uh, uh, hiring are two very interesting questions indeed. Uh, three points. The first point, on the mathematics side, the, on one side, you, you try to find the less bias, so the more generic answer. On the other one, you will try to find the frontier because you, you are looking for a criminal and so on. So you don't, you don't try to find someone in a large uh, set of people, but only one person uh, in a very specific way. So that's, we, we, call, we discuss it with Margot. But um, indeed, even on the, math, on the very scientific side, it's very interesting. Um, the second point about uh, a bias uh, on that is that uh, indeed you have the human bias, but even more, you have the data set bias. Uh, so at the end, I will, I, I will end by the open source question. But uh, the, the data set bias is that whether for the HR or for the criminal, you have your historical data set. In, even if you have a large enough data set that enable you to fine tune uh, the models, you will have your historical bias because uh, if you choose more women than men, then you will always choose more women than men because it's in your data. Uh, so at the end, if you want potentially unbiased, you can add an additional layer uh, based on uh, RHF, so re reinforcement learning with human feedback that could be used for, by, by, uh, by, the by the different teams to potentially unbiased the models with, a far with a, say, a RHF models that will be maybe may better and uh, le with less bias. Uh, and the third point, it is it's about open source because on the open source, yeah, it, it's a it's a big uh, elephant in the place because already talked about open source model, but it's what, what the fuck? We talked about the data set. We we have we you have, don't have any uh, wide data sets in any in the available models. So, for example, if you don't do RHF, especially for HR criminal, you don't even know what are the data sets which are in the foundation models. So, will you, is it really open source? Will you can you really trust in such a very sensitive case what is in, except if you add some layer of trust, some layer of uh, reinforcement learning, some layer of uh, assessment in your own process in your own uh, culture, uh, under, um, corporate culture, and uh, in in the way you want to, for example, hire someone which will have the right value of, of your organization. We can't finish on that, can we? It's very negative. <laughs> and uh, the, the next question, I'm not sure it will, it will solve the, the negativity issue because I wanted to look back to the AI Act. And we started the day saying, okay, we, well, Europe ambitions to be a global model for trustworthy AI. But if I ask you the question, I'm afraid of what the answer is going to be. Oh, I will surprise you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Try it, but in 30 seconds, because we need to go. Yes, yeah, so I will go fast. Uh, it, could, uh, it could take 10 words. Uh, so I exactly, I, I say quite the same at... Uh, at uh, Lucia actually just, just before, uh, I, I really think that the AI Act is the technical shield for Europe uh, because uh, it uh, enables European players to go faster if we are focused on what is needed by the European industry, where are any uh, US players is not ready and is not focused on that. And right. if you want a few words more, when, when you have some feedback from uh, Washington uh, main lobby uh, on the regulation, uh, you know that uh, the cloud market share 
of big players in Europe are slowing down because uh, most industrial que are questioning uh, whether they will develop and deploy their um, their uh, sensitive use case on the cloud of hyperscalers. So I definitely think if you want to finish on the positive point, I I, I really want the AI Act to be uh, to be signed at the end of this year, not to make it too complicated because. Uh, no, the commission new... never does that. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are some new insights uh, three weeks ago, which I uh, so keep it just uh, as simple as we can. Okay. But it will really be uh, a chance for Europe uh, to, uh, to to have this AI act. So. Can we end it here? A chance for Europe. It sounds be good. Fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> very good. So join me in thanking the speakers, please. <laughs> I will now hand over back to Emanuela and Jean-Frédéric for conclusions of the day. Okay, good. Okay, first, uh, thank you, Marilyn, because you had, uh, I mean, a uh, fantastic uh, management of the day today <laughs> through the panel and everything. So I think she deserves an applause too, because she was very good. Thank you. So it was a very interesting day, I have to say. I mean, we, we had lots of discussion. Uh, we heard lots of very interesting topic, lots of proposal. And when we, we sat together with jean frederic it was very difficult to find some conclusion to share with you because there were really lots and lots of things. So we tried to identify three, four topics, also because we know that there is the, the aperitif waiting for us, so we don't want to keep you too long. But it's, uh, I think that there were three, probably two, three, four messages that are really, I mean, uh, they're worthwhile sharing with you. So the first one that was also brought back uh, in this last panel, uh, in the very last question that Marilyn asked the panelists, uh, it's about, uh, I mean, the balance between regulation and innovation. And we started with this this morning, uh, and then we ended this today. And I think that this is really, I mean, one of the most important point, because on one hand, I mean, we all want regulation, I mean, for the stability of industry, for legal certainty and so on. On the other hand, I mean, we have the feeling, and it was also confirmed this morning by, by Lucilla Scioli, that we are talking too much about regulation. And this is also what we discussed a couple of days ago before the, the forum. And we were like, I mean, let's not focus on regulation because we need to focus on, inno to focus on innovation. And I think that this is also, I mean, a strong message that we need to bring forward because uh, like uh, Lucilla, she told us this morning, there are lots of things that have been, the, have been the, I mean, have been the, the commission has been doing uh, in the last four or five years uh, on innovation. But then every time there is a, a panel like this morning or this afternoon, then we end up talking about regulation. So I think that uh, regulation is important. We are really very much, like you just mentioned now, are looking forward for a signature and final approval of the AI Act by the end of this year. But then, I mean, let's start about how to develop innovation in Europe. Yeah, no, yes, definitely. And um, maybe just to complete what you've said, is that uh, also regulation can be seen as an opportunity too. Uh, it's not only a protection, and protection is important. I think that we are proud of our values as European, and I think it's good. We are proud of GDPR, and I think it's good to have good protection. Uh, but it's also an opportunity, and uh, I speak from a, a research institute, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, regulation is also an opportunity for research, because regulating AI is complicated, and it needs uh, strong uh, expertise in AI to regulate AI. So it's an opportunity for research and also for innovation. So we have to keep that in mind. Sure. So this brings us to the second point. So we, it has been asked several times, uh, what do we need to build a European ecosystem? And we heard the voices loud and clear that we need data, that we need data again, <laughs> data, and then computing power, computing power, computing power. 
and then we need talents, and then we need money as well. So I think that these moral race are the four most important things that uh, have been said by, especially by the industry, but I mean, but most of the speakers that we heard that we heard today. So we also heard that, which is also a very positive message, I mean, from the commission, that they are working on this. So there are already some proposal on the way, I mean, for making data available and for making computer um, power available for startup and uh, for PhD students uh, and so on. So I think that this is also a very positive message. Of course, uh, I mean, the speed of, um, of innovation requires, uh, I mean, a little bit more sense of urgency. So we will need them yesterday, not today. But I think that this has been uh, quite well understood and that there is uh, a plan on the table, I mean, to, to work on this. So I think that this is also a positive message today. Yes, absolutely. And uh, that's true that we need uh, money, computing power and so on, uh, and, and data, of course. Uh, and we can think bigger and bigger, but we can think also differently. And uh, uh, we can uh, think of building maybe smaller corpus to, to, for learning, but smarter corpus, uh, or to, to, to use a smaller model using a distillation. In other words, we can also have a more frugal approach, which can be a different path. Yeah. True, true, very true. Then the third point that we wanted to share with you, it's uh, it's also very interesting because the most of the people who spoke today here, they said that there is a strong need for a change in the narrative. So we need to start talking about AI, data and robotics in a very positive way. And this, uh, it's, uh, it's very important because, uh, I mean, like somebody said, AI is also fun. Also data and robotics, they can be fun. And people, they, the society, they should perceive them as fun and useful. And I think that this change in narrative is a very important topic because now we are living these two bubble. So there is one bubble of people who think that AI will kill us all. And then there is the bubble of the super optimistic people who think that AI will save us and will bring us to the next level of humanity. So of course, also here we need a sort of balance, but we need to start talking about the benefits, the positive things of AI. Of course, there are risks, but these are managed and can be managed. And I think that this is a very important point. And I think that another important thing related to this is the need for education to bring, they said it now in the last uh, panel, I mean, to, uh, to work on the awareness of the opportunities of this technology and also on the risk, of course, but how to manage them and how to educate people to using them. Of course, I mean, we didn't educate people to use Google. Maybe we should have somehow, but we need to start educating people about what we can do with this technology. And I think that something interesting also was said about the last mile of the innovation. So industry is doing, I mean, the innovation, developing new products and services, but the last mile is what is missing in the moment. So the adoption of this technology. So we also need to make sure that we invest in this last mile part. Yes, absolutely. And it's also the opportunity to recall the importance of education, the importance of the universities, uh, the role that they play in our society. It's also because it's the good place to interact with humanities. And we definitely need humanities as computer scientists, as mathematicians to address this kind of question. And also the importance of popularization of science. Uh, for the French people here, maybe the Canadian too, uh, a very famous uh, astrophysicist passed away recently, Hubert Reeves. And this guy has inspired several generations of young scientists. And I dream to see uh, computer scientists play, playing similar role uh, to popularize our, our science in, for, for young people. Yes, to make it attractive. And the last part, I think that while uh, I mean looking at what is, that has been said, listening to, to what everything that has been said and proposed today, I really feel, I mean, like I said it this morning, but that today more than ever, there is really a need to build a strong European community on AI, data and robotics and an innovation. And I think somebody this morning when uh, Marilyn asked them, what do you think about the European ecosystem? Somebody said the French ecosystem is already good, the European so-so, mm, the Czech not working yet. But I think that there is a need for a strong European 
ecosystem. I mean, this is very important. It's embryonal at the moment, but the fact that, I mean, we were 200 here today, and it's, this is the very first ADR forum. And I mean, we really feel the importance to be here today and to do something together. There are lots of things that need to be done because, I mean, today we put on the table really lots of things. And I really think that there is a need for a, a platform such as ADRA to bring together all these different interests and to work together. I mean, we are the private side of the partnership to work together with the commission, which was here today, listen to us, to all the requests. And I mean, they were carefully listening, which is not that obvious. And we really need to work together to do something together. Also because we, as we saw this morning, we are really in the middle of a tech revolution. Next year, we have a European election. We will have a new commission. So this is the moment really to do something to propose something big that we can do together as a tech community in Europe. Yes, we absolutely need to avoid the silos work at the European level. Uh, we do not know what will be needed tomorrow. So I think that our chance is to rely on mathematics, computer science. So we have to, to keep invest in those, in those sciences uh, in the spirit of what you are doing at ADRA, avoid building silos and uh, uh, have a, a wide view on uh, computer science and uh, digital science and technology, and also in partnership between academia and, and the private sector. So we just want to thank you again for being here today, because I think that, I mean, this was not possible without you being here today. So thank you. And I think that we all deserve a good drink and a good dinner now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So we wrap it here. Thank you very much to both of you, Manuela and Jean-Frédéric. This is indeed time for a drink, just practical uh, points. There will be shuttle uh, starting at uh, 5.45 uh, to go back to Versailles, but uh, starting from 6.15, you'll also have uh, shuttles to go to Domaine de Marly, where the dinner will take place for those who are going to the dinner. And the last good news of the day is that there is a day two. And so we all come back tomorrow, 9 a.m. So try not to enjoy too long the dinner tonight. Again, thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers throughout the day. Thank you to the participants online, on site. And see you tomorrow. <laughs>